This is Judith Lay welcoming you to Manx Radio and to the podcast of this week's edition of At Your Service. Manx Radio When you're there, you think, oh, this is exciting, this is an adventure, and then suddenly realise... It's a big adventure. And in a few moments, we'll find out all about Rachel and her husband Sylvester's big adventure because they're my special guests on today's programme. And as they're involved in mission work, I thought this would be a good hymn to introduce them. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. My Soul, the Greatness of the Lord, from the Huddersfield Choral Society. Thirteen years ago, the Methodist Church on the Isle of Man was twinned with the Methodist Church in Sierra Leone in West Africa. And during the summer, Angela Southern from Balagheri attended a major international conference in the capital, Freetown, representing not only the Methodist Church on the island, but Great Britain too. You might have heard Angela when she joined me on this programme recently to tell us all about it. Angela mentioned two people who were exceptionally helpful to her during her stay in Sierra Leone. And by a happy coincidence, they made a brief visit to the island recently and kindly spared me some time to record this conversation. They're both ordained ministers in the Methodist Church and are husband and wife, Reverend Sylvester Day and Reverend Rachel Day. Here's Rachel to explain their work in Sierra Leone. We're both mission partners, so we are sent from the Methodist Church of Great Britain to work with partner churches around the world in response to requests. So the Methodist Church in Sierra Leone, in our case, asked the Methodist Church in Great Britain for some help. So we were sent in response to that request for help. So we've been out in Sierra Leone since December 2021. We were delayed because of COVID and we're both involved in training. My primary role is teaching in the Theological College in Freetown, in the capital, um, and also working with training um, ministers and, and lay preachers for the Methodist Church. Sylvester, what's your role? My role is that of the director for the training and examination board. So my role is largely about putting in place the training strategy, but also about ensuring that the training does happen. 
And so, for example, at this conference that's just happened, I was reporting on the lay preachers training that we have put in place and are working through. And before the conference itself, we had succeeded in establishing a total of three examination centres, one in the Western District and two in the Bokenema District. And then um, going back in September, the intention is to establish two additional training centres in the Kalam and Kono districts. What we've realised is for a whole variety of reasons, the training has not happened in the way it should have done. So in order to become an ordained minister, you have to have been a lay preacher for two years before you can begin the process of training to be an ordained minister. But for a whole variety of reasons, often logistical. So if you live in, say, the far end of the country, you've got to come to Freetown to the capital to sit your exams. And it's cost prohibitive, so people aren't able to travel. So they they don't sit their exams, so they don't finish their lay preacher's training. Because they haven't finished their lay preacher's training, they can't offer as an ordained minister. So nobody or very few people are coming through offering to be ordained ministers. So as Sylvester says, we're we're enabling that training to be completed and and people are recognising now we can complete it. So there's a new enthusiasm to finish their training. And then whether they feel the call to ordain ministry or some other kind of ministry, that those opportunities are now opening up in new ways. And then we are looking at renewing the, the training programme for ordained ministers because we were told it takes too long. We need to reduce the time because it, it can take between seven to ten years from offering to being ordained. So we're working on a new approach so that the new student ministers are doing their training in a circuit for two years and then begin their probationary work and then go to the theological college later. So it reduces the time and that's an urgency because there is a shortage of ordained ministers across the whole connection. So we're enabling that flow and hopefully that growth. We had ministers who had been trained and who had been ordained and were already in circuit life and we were discovering that there were shortfalls in their training. And this pattern of going first, doing two years um, in circuit training, so you're training on the job, actually means that by the time you finish your probationary work and you're ordained, we know that we're releasing back to the people of God somebody who is competent and can get on with the work without reference back to training institutions. That is not to say that additional training will not be done. It will be done. But we are modelling a way of training that ensures that when we say you are ordained, you are worthy, you are now being ordained, you are indeed worthy and you're therefore fully trained to get on with the work that God has called you to do. The question that I love to ask people who are ordained in any denomination is why are you doing what you're doing. Sylvester? I have often said that my journey into ministry started reluctantly because as a youngster, my thoughts were not about going into the church or becoming a minister. My thoughts were elsewhere. But my journey into the ministry itself started as a youngster and being invited when I was at my Sunday school to do something in the life of the church. It was the Sunday school anniversary service and I was asked to do a very major role in it. So reluctantly, I did it. And suddenly I found those who were older than I coming alongside me and saying, we sense something in you and we think you need to respond to it. But as often happens in situations like this, you ignore what others are saying and you just go your merry way until eventually the minister then at that time came alongside me and said, would you like to do a few things more in the life of the church? And there my journey started gradually to the point where I suddenly realized beyond a shadow of a doubt that indeed God was calling me not to go down the path that I had thought I was going to go down, but to go down a different path. And so God gave the challenge and I returned a challenge back to him saying, look, if this is where you want me to go, then you're going to have to be a bit more firmer with me. And there's one thing I've learned, and I always say this to people, never challenge God. 
because I did that and three times he came back and said yes I am calling you and so I then said so be it and I think I'm safe in saying I've never looked back. Rachel tell me your story. I trace my call to a a book I was given when we were given Sunday school prizes. I was eight years old and at the end of the year we were all given a prize and I was given a book and it was called My Book About Hudson and it told the story of Hudson Taylor who was a missionary to China in the I think the 1800s and I didn't know what a missionary was. I'd never read a book like this and it captured something of my imagination and I was just amazed that this man went to the other side of the world to tell people about Jesus and as an eight-year-old I was like I want to go to the other side of the world to tell people about Jesus and so there was a seed planted in me at that point and I hadn't realized it and over time I kind of forgot about that and at school I, I loved languages so did French and German long story short things didn't quite work out as smoothly I applied to study French at university. My A-level grades weren't as good, so I ended up studying theology. And gradually, through that sense, this call, but the call to overseas ministry kind of took a back seat. And I would often, when I was asked to give my testimony, when churches ask you, how did you become a minister? And I always started with my Sunday school prize. But I used to say, you don't have to go to the other side of the world to tell people about Jesus. We need to do it where we are. But we ended up in, in Freetown because we, we had a sabbatical and we, we went to visit in 2008. And it was only about seven years after the end of the Civil War. So you could still see the effects of that in the buildings, in the lives of the people and real struggles still to, to get back on their feet fully. And we remember one evening we, we were looking out over the city from someone's veranda and felt that real sense of of God calling us and saying to us in the words of Isaiah, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And that sense, Lord, if this is where you want us to be, we're willing, we'll come. But it took us another 10 years or so to actually begin to process that. In those 10 years, we realized when we finally came that the experiences that we'd gained in that time, I'd done some further study. We'd both had different responsibilities in the life of the church. And what the Methodist Church Sierra Leone was asking for, we can see that actually God has been preparing us for this time, for this moment. We couldn't have responded to the training needs without that experience that we'd gained in that 10 years. So yeah, it's amazing how God works in that way. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry. All who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? My hand will 
John Michael Talbot and Here I Am, Lord. Back now to my special guests today, Methodist Ministers, Reverend Sylvester and Reverend Rachel Day, mission partners working in Sierra Leone. Can I tell you a story? We've travelled around back on furlough telling people about the Methodist Church in Sierra Leone. And a lot of people think that the Methodist Church in Sierra Leone was started with missionaries. But it wasn't. It was started by freed slaves from Nova Scotia and Canada who were brought to Freetown and given their freedom. And they brought the gospel with them. There were some Methodists among that number. And they brought the gospel and planted the Methodist church there. And in about 1806, they wrote to the Methodist church in Britain saying, we're getting old, can you send somebody to help us? And from their first letter, it took about six, seven years before someone was sent. And that's how then the church began to grow with that partnership between the two. And again, we were telling this story last week and it suddenly dawned on us how our story and that story is very similar that the request had come, but there was a, a gap between the the missionary being sent. Um, and it, it just confirms in us more and more that not to worry, not to be anxious, but trust God's timing. He does bring things to fruition. We had that 10-year gap, or 10-year lull, if you want, where we, on the one hand, thought, God, what, what are you doing? But at the same time, God was not just resourcing us, but also teaching us how to rely on each other, but much more importantly, how to rely on him. And I think if there was one thing that uh, um, has come very firmly home to us, is that so often when we read the word missionaries or when we he- hear the word mission partner and things like that, we, our mind goes back to the, to the old days where missionaries left to plant churches. That's not what we are doing. What we are doing is much more for coming alongside our brothers and sisters in Sierra Leone and helping them as God grows his church in Sierra Leone. I noticed this very early, that when, whenever you are praying with people, they are saying thank you to God for things. They are thanking God for that we're alive this morning, that we've woken up this morning, that we have light, that we have water. And it, it challenged me to think that they're the things that here, when I'm back at home, I don't remember to say thank you to those things, that I've woken up alive. Because with the life expectancy in Sierra Leone, it is a lot lower. And, and people see people at very young ages just dying very suddenly. And the, the healthcare service is very different. So you are so mindful that people are thankful for those basic things above everything else. And birthdays are always celebrated on a Sunday in the church as well. Because God has brought us through another year. And we're trusting him for the next year. And it's that basic joy in that thankfulness. 
that you you forget about when you know you're going to turn on the tap and the water will come and it'll be drinkable you know you flick the light switch and it will come but there these things don't always happen so so it's a different sense of thanksgiving and gratitude You know, looking back, whatever ministry God calls you to do, there's a sense of needing to be brave, if you like. But that sense of if God is calling me, God will equip me with all that I need. And we're surrounded by others who are supporting us, who are praying for us, without whom we couldn't do the work. And perhaps we wouldn't feel as brave. But also that sense of partnership, that yes, we're on the front line, but the, those praying for us and supporting are part of that work um, and partnership. And with technology now, I think that's one thing that the COVID lockdowns taught us about connecting on online with people and Zooming. And we can have a Zoom conversation with people back here and share our work more directly. So, yes, there is perhaps a degree of braveness, but you don't always think about that till when you're there you think oh this is exciting this is an adventure and then suddenly realize it's a big adventure but we are not on our own God is with us and we are surrounded by those who are praying for us and are sharing in the work from a distance for whom we're grateful
thank you to husband and wife Methodist ministers Reverend Sylvester and Reverend Rachel Day, mission partners working with the Methodist Church in Sierra Leone, which is twinned with the Methodist Church here on the island. And now, as usual, we finish with a look at our notice board. This afternoon, there'll be a special choral evensong in the cathedral in Peel at half past three, celebrating the anniversary of the accession of King Charles III. Tonight, the Mariners' Choir will be making their first visit to Jerby Parish Church. The preacher will be Reverend Andrew Coleman, the soloist will be Mr Bill Corlett and the organist Mr John Neal. The service starts at half past six and will, as usual, be followed by supper and community hymn singing. Looking now to the week ahead, and this Wednesday the 11th, it's the final concert in this year's summer series of weekly concerts in St Thomas's Church here in Douglas, and it'll be given by the Londu Male Voice Choir, conducted by Julian Power. Starting at the usual time of a quarter to eight, it's free admission with refreshments afterwards and a retiring collection. And St Thomas's Church is just off Douglas Promenade, close to the Gaiety Theatre. And on Thursday evening, the versatile choir Musicale will be in concert in the Erin Arts Centre in Port Erin, starting at half past seven. Admission is free with a retiring collection and there'll be refreshments served after the concert. On Friday the 13th, between noon and half past one, you're invited to pop into Port St Mary Methodist Church for a tasty Tabor soup lunch. All are welcome, there's no need to book. Also on Friday the 13th, Orisdale Chapel invites you to their harvest celebration. It's next Friday evening at half past six. The chairman is Gordon Clegg. John and Fiona Anderson will speak about harvest at Nokelo Beg. And the soloists are Simon Fletcher and Penny Lavery. Admission is free and if you'd like to bring along some food to share, that would be much appreciated. That's at Orisdale Chapel next Friday evening at half past six. Looking now to next weekend, and on Saturday morning, between half past ten and noon, there's a coffee morning at Ballakilferrick Chapel. Also next Saturday the 14th, there's a coffee morning in Moran Parish Church in support of the Leprosy Mission. It's open from half past ten until noon, and Community Partnerships Manager Mike Hardy will be there with the latest campaign news. And whilst admission is free, donations for the work of the Leprosy Mission would be much appreciated. Also on Saturday the 14th, visiting organist Joe Watson will give a morning concert of popular classics in St Thomas's Church here in Douglas. It's free of charge and there's no need to book. It starts at 11 o'clock on Saturday morning and it'll be followed by a sandwich lunch, but you do need to book if you would like to stay for lunch. Phone or text John Riley on 491 309. 491 309. Also on Saturday the 14th, Londu Male Voice Choir will be in concert in Sulby Methodist Church. It's next Saturday afternoon at half past two. Admission is £10, including homemade refreshments. There's no need to book, just come along. Everyone will be made most welcome. And finally, Sunday, September the 15th, finds the Mariners Choir in Kirkmichael Parish Church. The service starts as usual at half past six and will be led by Reverend Jeanette Hamer. And I'm afraid that's all that we have time for now, but I'll be back later with sundown. A warm welcome into our virtual lounge tonight from nine o'clock onwards. Virtually everything you'll need to round off your day, alongside some very real easy listening music, your requests and dedications. And I'd love you to join me if you can. And so... Till whenever we meet again, this is Judith saying thank you for listening and I wish you and those you love a blessed and peaceful week and a very good morning. Mm